Okay. So, to paint this picture, I think it really helps to kind of take several steps back away from the characters themselves, just for a moment, to build an understanding of the setting. Things that your characters would know subconsciously that they've just picked up over time. The important aspect of the setting always boils down to the nature of the soul, which is divided into three parts. That theme of the division of one thing, one life, being divided across three things, will repeat itself a lot. It repeats itself most namely in the existence of the three dreams. The dream before, the Feywild, the waking dream, the material plane as you know it, and the dream after, the Shadowfell. Now, these things are often understood as being sometimes not just separate planes of existence, but separate points along a singular timeline. One after the other. Dream before, waking, dream after. And that cycle repeats itself throughout the universe. Each timeline and each branch coming to an end inevitably. Now that inevitable apocalypse is understood by the gods. They have long known about it and they've watched many, many multiverses come and go. They are watching it happen now. As to them, time exists all at the same time. Now, in this perspective of seeing the vast tapestry of time laid out around them, the gods notice frayings at the edges and bits of the fabric of this universe, this multiverse, is being pulled apart. Now, the nature of these fraying universes, some of them decided to try and patch themselves, pulling threads from around them and just creating knots, and those knots getting tugged at to end up tearing whole sections out of this fabric. And as they watch this happen, it gets worse and worse. And the gods, going through their cycle, go through many drastic decisions to try and repair this fabric. Now, some of those things happen in the future of one timeline. And some of them happen in the past of another time. As they briefly exert control over individual times. The only exception to this being the fool, who is known to only ever choose to exist in one timeline. He is never across the multiverse. There is only ever one fool. And that world, the universe that the fool has chosen to walk around in, happens to be the one that you guys live in. And this is no mere coincidence. As the fool may look like he wanders aimlessly, he only goes where fate draws him. And the strings of fate are very strong on this particular timeline. One of the strong reasons for this being that there is an iteration of Saint Ava who exists in pretty much every single one of these. She is one of those strong mainstays of the multiverse. But the saints are doomed to die. That's the way it always goes. Every saint is destroyed. But not this time. The golden thread of fate keeps it strong as Saint Ava still lives in this one. But everything works in threes in this setting. It's always about one life that's been separated into multiple. And 
Though you have recovered, St. Ava, Gwyn, she calls herself, she seems a pale shadow of herself. And in fact, there seems to be another like her, another her, communing and speaking to a paladin of St. Ava, Zarman Zimenov. Zarman is a champion of St. Ava, partially born of his bloodline and partially of the happenstance of fate, having drawn him to be nearby St. Ava when she called out for help. As Zarman and a couple of other orphans who were also drawn by that same tug of fate to this same place found themselves interacting with one of those knots in the fabric. As they twist around in it, having several iterations, 173 of them to be precise, these paradoxes are spit out into the future. Just one of those 173 versions having made it out together as a group. But 15 years into the future of their own timeline. Now, they find that St. Ava, though recovered, is but a portion of her former self. And the gods seem very keenly interested in, help, in helping you help restore her divinity. Their motivations for this are pretty simple. They've picked this iteration of St. Ava to sit on an empty spot in the thrones of the gods. The Empress has been missing for some time. Seers like Hanu, who study the movements of the stars, have long noted that it's far past the time that the era of the Prince of the Empress should have begun. That she hasn't taken her seat. That seat remains vacant as the gods have been trying to groom Saint Ava to fill that spot. But with an empty spot of power comes other manipulations to try and grab it. The devil exists as a primary candidate for this, as he has created an avatar of himself that should be capable of not only having the power and knowledge of a god, but also being able to take the power of faith, like Saint Ava, and using that to then take the throne that formerly belonged to the Empress. Now, of course, why the devil would wish to do this is a motivation only known to the devil. It could just be taking advantage of vulnerability for his own game. One weak spot in the multiverse could open him up to being able to have power across the entire multiverse. And all he has to do is affect one timeline. Unfortunately, the fool has chosen the same timeline to go traipsing through, tugging at people's fates and pulling him along onto his adventures until all of a sudden they've all been swept up on a journey. Because it was one Victor Gray, who the group has long theorized and surmised is actually the fool himself, that first gave this group their initial mission and a ship and a name. A name that has come with a lot of implications across a lot of timelines. Amongst this, there are several other people trying to take advantage of this chaos. Most of them not aware of that grand threat to the multiverse or the machinations of the devil himself. 
Though there are some that are aware of the devil, even amongst those actors such as Kumo Suchi, a actor on the global stage whose allegiances are still in question, having ties to the devil and to the Ashfall Covenant, and even, it seems, to the nation of Zhao La and the sleeping king himself. As actors like Pridwin and those closest to him that have become aware of his plans make long-standing goals the types of plans that spend generations, even hundreds, thousands of years, in the case of Pridwin. You found yourselves embroiled in what appears to be several... How should I put it? I guess machinations is the best word for it. Between some very powerful entities who are all trying to vie for coming out on top when the world ends. None of them are trying to stop the world from ending. They all seem to be trying to view that as the moment to turn the tables. Along this way, You've also had to deal with some unknown agents that seem to be playing the same game. Other than knowing about Kumo Suchi and Pridwin, uh, you also have met the Marvesi family, um, who you've just recently gained more reason to possibly uh, be suspicious of. Um, and... Then, as well, there is uh, the Krova family, uh, who operates out of Yellum, and then other organizations or actors who you don't yet have identities on, but who seem to be pivotal players in this because they keep showing up, and that is the Black Lily, and... The woman with the white feathered cloak. And that about summarizes it for the most part. I mean... Okay. So... I need to collect my thoughts one sec. No, take your time. Any questions are a valid question. So, so I guess there's, there's certain events that get vaguely talked about that I just wanted clarification on. Mm -hmm. so, so the Order of Saints Blood is the Maravess in our timeline from what the party has experienced kind of in game that's connected to the Maravesis and related to why Zale is a blood hunter. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the order of saints blood, um, as was explained to Zale and Eliza, um, and to a lesser extent, the others as well, um, is a organization that actually, uh, has multiple, um, like, branches of itself all right uh they all seem to deal with fighting against supernatural threats um and curses and stuff like that so if there are supernatural threats on this world the order of saint's blood deals with it they also seem to be very focused on fighting against um their their overarching mission is that they're dealing with uh fighting against uh the dream after and the shadow king aberrations and you know 
apocalyptic monsters from you know the dream after so but... in terms of the dream after and the dream before um and everything how much of that does the actual group know everybody oh. everybody knows about the dream before and the dream after oh, everybody uh, commoners, yeah even commoners understand oh, okay. that, that or know that stuff it's um uh like the old origin story fairy tales of the beginning of the world okay that is good to know. Yeah, anytime you see a fey creature, you would be like, oh, that thing came from the dream before. The idea that the dream before is, you know, a cycle of time is something that really only, like, wizards and people that study that stuff understand or know. Most people just assume, like, think of them as separate, like, places, you know, because okay. you can visit them, you know? Yeah. But what you're really doing is traveling far into the future. So far into the future, you actually pretty much kind of exit your timeline, right? It's like, you're, uh, imagine that, like, your timeline has, like, very loose threads that are, like, dangling out into the multiverse, but they're, like, magnetic, and they always want to end up eventually connecting to the dream app. Right. Okay. Uh, but they won't until, you know, one of them becomes, you know, solid. In a way, the uh the dream after is a pos is the dream after is the is the apocalypse, right? It is the inevitable end of the world, right? And it always exists there and it will always be there. And like as it's seen like uh the reason that that seems to be is that you know people end up using Maiko's eyes and it ends up you know causing problems and then the apocalypse happens but there are actually like there's an, a a completely separate set of threats that end up bringing about the end of the world that have nothing to do with that mm -hmm. like there is like pretty much a, almost like a hard limit to the end of the world um but that does seem to get like flexed a lot like some of these timelines the paradoxes managed to keep the universe alive until 1956 all right uh and some of them the universe ended in 1945 and some of them they get all the way to like the 2000s all right Shit. um but it's uh like and so in terms of actual time travel that the paradoxes have experienced they have gone into the future yeah they went into, years the, into future, the future 15 years into the future and uh and then with you right now they've traveled 44 years into the future mm -hmm. that's the only time travel they've experienced and then the alternate timeline that you guys were talking about uh the apocalypse uh, one. The yes, apocalypse yes, yes. arc, yeah. There's that, but that was a, technically a dream. Yes, that was uh, that was uh, Killam having had a dream induced by Maiko, where Maiko showed him another timeline and then asked him what he saw. You know, like he was she was looking through his eyes to, in a way, spy on another multiverse. Mm -hmm. that's actually the moment that Maiko in your guys's universe realized the power of her eyes being she didn't realize she could see across the universe so she she used to kill him because she didn't know she could just look through her own eyes all right but once she got there and learned that information she goes i have hidden talents i didn't realize i had i need to figure out how this works so maiko has been pretty silent kind of doing her own shit figuring out how to lock her hidden talent to peer across the multiverse. Hmm. Uh, that's what she's doing during this arc. But, um... Uh, but yeah, no. That's uh, the only time travel that they've done. And that other thing with the Apocalypse arc, uh, that's the one that Arthur is from. Um, hmm. And in that one, uh, they had time traveled a lot, right? Yeah. The way Arthur recounts his upbringing, he traveled, like, all the way back to pretty much the bereavement and then back up again, all right? Shit. Like, so he's, he's been all over the place. He, his years of, like, going up into, like, like, his childhood 
up into booking 16 was outside of time and space and a demiplane inside of Lib's mind. And then from 16 to like his early 20s, he traveled backwards through time, right? So pretty much like every couple of like weeks and sometimes months, they were just further back in time than when they'd been before, right? So like his experiences with like meeting people and like getting to know people in the world was meeting somebody's great granddaughter and then like a week later meeting like you know the like, the great great grandmother all right oh, okay and that being the order in which he met people right he, he's met people's descendants before he like met them and then he went the other way back up again and like hopped and skipped and then waited several years for a period of time and then the uh paradoxes came back uh and they said we're sending you to another time because we need you to find something that we lost and make sure that we don't lose it and then just like didn't give him any more information didn't even tell him what he was looking for though he hasn't admitted that to the group mm -hmm. um and to fucking find something that they fucking lost maybe you might want to tell me what it is but it was just like some, it's literally, a, it's, it's a, it's a fucking, you want to know what they lost? You want to know what they lost? lost hope. Keys. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Uh, they, they, they're, Hanu of any timeline is exactly the one who fucking, <laughs> it was Hanu who delivers this line. Of as he course. Gets into the uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then he popped up in this timeline and found out that he didn't just travel forward or backwards. This is a completely different dimension. He like, went adjacent. Alternate. Yeah, he went adjacent, which is a first for him. Like, his entire life experience is going up and down the same timeline. But, like, opposite from most people's perspectives of it. And then... Uh, and then all of a sudden he realizes, oh, shit, I'm on a completely different timeline... That means I'm never, really, probably never going to see them again, right? Like, mm -hmm. why did they do this? And they didn't even explain that that's what they were doing. Like, fucking Arthur. Fucking dude's got a lot that he's got to try and figure out. Mm -hmm. And no desire to admit that he's trying to figure it out. <laughs> like, it's just going to happen. Whatever's happening, happens. Gosh. Okay. But just so, so yeah. So Oh, I'll say that. Go ahead. I just envisioned like a small little beacon of hope on a paper boat in the ocean as it gets darker and darker as hope is lost. Like, no! Oh. Arthur, find it! Find the boat again! Yeah, and then, you know, in this timeline, Arthur finds a little beacon of hope on a paper boat. Uh. Just, oh, just a just to throw my two cents in also we already have arthur for a timeline and he was he raised us mm -hmm. and we don't know, we don't know when, he, when he got here at all and, right. and that's yeah yeah happened. that's another that's another loose end on it because that arthur is older um and and in the same timeline though you know that arthur is yet to be born which means that the arthur that raised them is not from this timeline Right. So, oh, okay. Yeah. And that's because something that Arthur, no. Arthur in your timeline, as far as you know, is what or like is still a baby inside of you know a body inside of the tomb of the Forgotten Saints. Yeah, that's technically there's three Arthurs in our timeline, and there was already one already here who who raised us and brought all the Arthurs together. Yeah. On Koyuko. That's why when we were um, trying to scry or potentially find out where this young Arthur is, uh, Arthur oh, was mentioning um, that I will we mention had the, 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 the names that were mentioned for the houses of Saints mm -hmm. Blood. One of them was Wardstock. Yeah. 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 I took that. I took that as a note. Mm -hmm. So. <sighs> So that's why, like, right now, if we were trying to find out where this, the Arthur that belongs from this timeline is, we would have to tell older Arthur, put on your shrine necklace so we can find out where the other one is. Yeah.
And who mm -hmm. knows if there is, even is an other one who's, you know, chilling about stuff. Yeah. It's, well, it's no, an old can of worms. Which so. we did find out he's in um, the animals that he did. World of Ear. World of Ear. So. Yeah, we have a. Yeah, we have a, since From learning this, because we haven't even seen older Arthur since the whole adventure started. That's the thing. And so now we have yeah. all this information. So and, I mean, for at least for Cell, Arthur's his dad, this Arthur that was raised as. So he has a lot of questions and a lot of seeking that he wants kind of answers for. Because mm -hmm. now learning all of this, he's like, yeah, you have a you have a multiverse of history that informed things before you ever stepped foot on that island. All of all of the stuff that you guys are discovering and learning and becoming a part of, you know, are all the things that precipitated why an Arthur would go to another timeline. Because you have to think that Arthur is older, which means that he and his timeline probably experienced a lot of things before he came to your timeline and started on that island with a little pub to raise some orphans mm -hmm. to kick things off to get yeah, things I started oh, so many so many questions but, yep so many questions i mean honestly I'm, it's gonna be the funny thing is that i mean i already made him so wide but he's gonna call, he's gonna call Older Arthur, he's not gonna call him Older Arthur, he's gonna call him Dad, Arthur, and then Cal, if we have all three of the crew. Because <laughs> this is... Older Arthur is da his Zell's dad. I mean, that's yeah. just how Zell feels about him, and it's just, he's supposed to know <laughs> why. Okay, and so, after you guys got teleported, you went to Port Valiant, like, kind of after, did you meet Victor first? Uh, we actually appeared in Broken Star Bay. Oh, okay, so that was yeah, after the time travel, that's there. where you showed up. Yeah, so after oh. the events of the uh, Koiko ruins the first time, and that's what started us in the adventure, and the gods helped us survive it. Okay. We appeared 15 years in the future near Broken Star Bay. Okay. And then you had some shenanigans there. Right, that's where we recruited Maya, Kelly, and Rana. Uh, along with a few others that aren't around right now. Oh, and Willem. I know, yeah, I was like, wow, husband. you totally Everyone skipped Willem. Fucking, huh. Wow. Yeah, with Willem involved some debating with some local trouble shit, so, you know. God. <laughs> and Willem. Yeah. And Willem. Yeah, God, Willem. I, hate, I just remembered that. I, I hate there, it. Every, everybody else was able to just be, like, approached and hired. Willem had, like, a whole mini quest to, like, recruit him because he right, yeah. get him out without a local pirate lord trying to slit her throats for it <laughs> yeah so they had to go gain favor from the pirate uh the lord of the pirate lords right which was um shark the shark and oh, okay. the, sh the shark um is actually a character from my last campaign uh so and he seems to be heavily aware of the game being played as well Yes, he seems he's another one of those shadow players, but he hasn't his his role has gone a bit on the back burner, but it's an important one as well. Um, and the fact that that first mission that he sent them on, see, uh, the way he uh set that up is he said that the ship uh that they had that there was a trade that was done with Victor for that gauntlet, all right, that Zale has that whole entire scenario happened because of the aid of uh the shark um the shark um in return was supposed to have victor's help in finding something in these nearby ruins on an island known as yoake uh, or yoake rather the facility is called yoake um but the um uh so since they showed up with his boat and, you know, the name of the, his organization, you know, with their names on it, uh, he visited that 15-year-long waiting debt on them, all right, and said, hey, 
you go do this task that was already, you know, promised to me by your man, Victor, and I'll let you, you know, take your friend out of jail, all right? Uh, and keep the pirate lord that, you know, wants Willem, you know, off you guys while you're here, all right? Um, so they went to yo okay she um, recruited some people and stuff, ended up out there. Yeah, uh, yo okay she is where we met Hanu. Yes, okay. And okay. yo okay she they met Hanu. Hanu had been led there by visions that she had been a seer on one of these islands nearby. And as the oracle there, she escaped because she got a vision that sent her to that island where she like waited and camped out for several days before uh, finally uh, the group arrived. And they went in. There was a Myconid city in there and... Uh, they ended up uh, finding that this place used to be a precursor research facility. Um, that a lot of the precursor ruins in the Coterie Coast are pretty much... You could think of them as advanced Cerberus labs from Mass Effect, right? <laughs> but like thousands of years old now, right? So it's because like Cerberus... Been, like, a reapers almost yes exactly mm. and these research facilities were back before the bereavement happened there were only like three really big islands down here all right um but now the coder coast is like that huge amount of shattered islands and it's because the gods literally fucking walked the earth down there and the saints all died and had a huge epic battle and it broke the entire fucking continent up and those three islands got shattered, and the secret research facilities that were down there all got, you know, submerged underneath the ocean and lost and stuff, right? Now, the vast majority of the world wasn't even aware of the research that was going down there already, right? This was the Avalonian Empire having a secret research initiative that they did with the Precursors. The Precursors are... Uh, the three races of dwarfs, orcs, and Eladrin. Now, they're called the Precursors because uh, they seem to come from a time before or outside of our own universe. They're not from here. Um, okay. And then I have a quick question about the Precursors. Are they kind of like common knowledge? Yes. Like, every, okay. Yeah. Um, Everybody's uh, aware of the fact that there are no longer Eladrin, Orcs, or Dwarfs in the world. Oh um, yeah, which is why Valente is so weird. Yes, uh, Valente is one of those oddities. There are the even the High Elves have all left. Um, uh, they right after like the immediate disappearance of most of the Eladrin, the High Elves all kind of slowly over the course of like a couple of decades disappeared into their face fires and then never came out. Um, and the, um, so they, they all left after the bereavement, pretty much abandoning ship. All right. They're like, well, this universe is fucked and they all left. All right. Um, they, however, they, while they had been here, uh, the Avalonian empire had said, yeah, you can stay in our, you know, universe as, you know, refugees or whatever. Um, but you have to help us, you know, understand your technology and your advancements. And that's what the Southern Isles were. The Southern Isles were research facilities. And those research facilities um, studied the research of the dwarfs and the orcs and the Eladrin which are the three uh, fields for uh, the artificers in my setting. That's why elven technology always is based off of arcanics, like Zale stuff. Um, and the dwarven technology is all clockwork and mechanics and, you know, like hard tech. Kind of like Kelly's stuff. Like Kelly's stuff. And then there are the rare uh, orcish ones. Now, the orcs 
The orcs didn't do a whole lot of actual research down there. They had a different function. Um, the orcs actually protected the Southern Isles. They were split up into what they referred to as shogunates. Uh, there were 72 shogunates, one for each of the facilities that exist that existed back then. Um, each of those shogunates had a shogun that was in charge of an entire like armada of like, you know, orcs. And these orcs were, you know, highly disciplined warriors that and whole purpose was of protecting these isles, all right? They pretty much mostly answered to the uh, to the Aladrin, all right? They had worked a deal with them. Uh, there were some uh, issues between them and the dwarfs occasionally, but they all worked, like, towards the same common ends as them acting like security forces. And then you would have dwarven research facilities, and then you would have Aladrin research facilities. There were occasionally orc research facilities. One of those was the okay, she, right? And the Yorks, they studied things that helped their soldiers be better soldiers, usually, or helped feed their, you know, armies, all right? Um, Yokei Shi, specifically, uh, the Yorks stuff is bio, uh, biotech, all right? Uh, they look at, like, rewriting DNA and shit like that, right? They're biology scientists. Um, and... Yo, okay, she wasn't doing anything like creating super soldiers or anything crazy like that. They were researching how to grow food in inhospitable and impossible environments, right? Um, that and... sounds like a perfect in for Nina. Just going to throw that out there. And they, um, uh, as they were there, uh, the bereavement had buried that facility underground and made it inaccessible its entrances for its walls there were no doors in yalakeshi um it used to only be accessible uh during daytime and at night the doors would literally disappear um so without sunlight there are no doors to enter it but because it got buried underground you know no sunlight so it just looked like there were no doors they were able to suss out and, you know, with Hanu, use a daylight mirror that uh, uh, be able to open up one of those doorways. And they got into Yokeshi, where the energy from this, you know, lamp that they had built there to be able to, like, encourage active growth had done that uninhibited underground for a couple thousand, almost, you know, well... 1900 However years long you know? right um and for you know about 1900 years they uh eventually gained like sentience and stuff and they actually ended up having the two types of uh overgrowth that had gained sentience one of them were these mold creatures and the other ones were these myconid these fungi creatures um the uh, two of them were at odds and at war with each other, and the group kind of found themselves on the sides of the of the docile and kind myconids. Um, and at the same time that they were there, a falling star crashed into the facility. And as they ended up finally getting to like the central location of the lamp itself, which was guarded by this. Uh, what appeared to be like a wooden person, right? They looked like they were grown out of bark or something, right? They had formerly been a samurai uh, that had been in charge of this facility, actually. And uh, he had a whole tragic story going on with like a blood willow tree that they had seen outside and shit. And they ended up promptly like negating him during the fight by making him like burst into laughter and as he dropped his weapon they disarmed him and because he'd been disarmed he uh committed a uh, ritual suicide for you know failing in his duty oh, and, geez. um and as they went there to get this part because what they'd been sent there for by the shark was a specific odd piece all right some mechanical contraption 
the schematics were given to Zale. He was able to suss out some of what it was intent for, but mostly figure out that it's part of a bigger whole. That something, that this part is being used here, and this machine had been built to take advantage of its use, but the machine there was not its original intent. That it was actually part of a different machine and that they had used it at this facility you know mostly he had been using it to help him guard the facility it had the ability to like offer like some teleportation advantages it bent space and um so they they ended up taking that thing and they lied and ended up saying that they didn't have it and that gith took it now gith is the falling star she had crashed in through the top of that thing by evidently falling straight out of the fucking sky like a meteor and barrels into this facility. And Gith is, at first glance, looks to be like a half-orc, but there's just like this freckleish kind of like thing to her skin. Um, she's not a race that you guys have seen before, but she is the Gith, uh, the Gith Yonki. Uh, She's not just the Gith Yonki. Gith is the origin of the Gith Yonki. She is the Gith. Um, and there's a whole bunch of lore about her in Spelljammer, and I pretty much used that, and I fill in the blanks, because there are a lot of blanks. Um, but uh, she's Killam's mom. Uh, uh, though those dots weren't necessarily connected at that time. Um... And she plays like a whole little thing, like you know what, you can hold on to this. I know where to get. Yeah, it after some persuasion from Simon, it ended up getting into our bag. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Without her giving that. difficulty, but you know, as soon as she left, the thing came back because she banished that thing to get the piece herself. But we convinced to give it to us, and then she bamped out after giving it to us. Yeah. The problem is, she quit concentrating on banish. I know. Then Samurai came back, and we we're like, okay, awkward. Okay, this listen, is awkward. Uh, so what ended up happening before, as we were going there, the elder's brother, who was a bio uh, tech kind of artificer, said, "I could put a replacement in there because he he had noticed that yeah. okay, this isn't really a living god; it's just an artifact that can give life." Or and they something. had been worshiping the the yeah. lamp that provided their light down yeah. there so um, and was responsible yeah. for all of the like the active growth so um, uh, so he was just he like figured out how to replace it. yeah like if you could do that and get me an in and give me the body of the samurai you know yeah, yeah, all this other stuff and they were like please no so we managed to convince all the myconids to go up to the surface by like some uh, like a tag team religion uh between the paladin and the cleric saying well you're deity gave you life and enough like knowledge to go share it with others you don't just stick over here there's other things above the surface that you can do you know you've right. gotten these she gave you so. life live it to the best you can so we managed to bring and everybody ever since, then, one, ever since then the young chief to be uh has been namiko. traveling been tra on, <laughs> yeah namiko uh has been traveling on the boat he mostly is just there for the sightseeing and to like you know learn about the world. So he, like he he's not a follow tag along. I mean, battle he, he has his own kind of endeavors he's been doing. I think what we we realized was he has a side business of just selling mushrooms. You know, just yeah, he grows around. mushrooms down in the bottom of the hole of the ship and it love it. Feeds the crew and stuff. Right, it's one of those things of uh, we didn't know how to handle a crew full of pirates. He's been subtly helping us with the morale. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yep. He's fucking adorable. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, and then they made their way back, did some deception thing about not having that part, but they've been keeping well, it Well, it wasn't deception, it's because Lib stole it from Zarman without him noticing, and Zarman told him the truth, I don't know where the fuck it went. <laughs> yes, yes. Lib, Lib it stole it, which is why I'm saying there was some deception from... There's some deception. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
Liv, Liv pickpocketed it from the group and didn't tell the group, so they thought it went missing, and they thought it was because Gith stole it back somehow. Oh, no, it wasn't but... Gith, though. We assumed it was Captain Bones because we had an interaction with him, and it was slowly, a little bit after that, when Zarman noticed it was gone. Yeah, there were a couple of theories that were bounced around on it. Yeah, because yeah, I said it was uh, Gith. You said it was Captain Bones. That's right, what I, I mean, uh, but it's because Zarman at that time was also cautious of, uh, what's his name? He's a part of a crew now. Anaya. Anaya. There we go. Uh, of Anaya, because yeah. he was actually watching us through a familiar on top of like one of the masts. And then, you know, pointing out the bones. Yeah. Well, why is he watching from us from there? Mm -hmm. No. And then I'm talking about how Zarman is familiar with familiars, but you know. Because <laughs> uh, at that point, Rue had been using one. Mm -hmm. And Kek also had one. So... <laughs> he had to trust him. Uh, Rue had a mini, th a and... mini uh, mini phoenix. The thing with Anaya is that he is an Eladrin, and he was seen on the island that Honey was a seer of, so he's well known amongst the Puaimanas of the region. It's a little bit of some, you know, but nobody really. You know, right. It, it's one of those things that we didn't really talk to him because we were dealing with uh, Captain Buns yeah. jesting about talking with. Uh, Trying to get Willem back or whatever. Yeah, but then later on. But his, but you know, with enough insight, Zarman picked up. He was actually after Zell Scott one. Yeah, but also later on, uh, he uh, Zarman approached him. They had a talk and realized that Captain Bones's ship was the one who discovered Zarman's egg and then passed tanks well, it wasn't, to somewhere else. Well, I mean, a little bit more nuanced than that. Yeah, Captain just, Bones attacked the ship. Yeah. Zarman was on as an egg. Quote unquote, discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we so found it. Zarman was plundered by Captain Bones and Anaya and, and, the, and their crew and was given to somebody who's was some wanting these eggs because apparently they can incubate it. Yeah, so... so and then, of course, they hold the egg there. And, That's where it's assumed Zarman was born. And Captain Bones is a relative of Eliza's family, so it's weird. Yeah, and then, of course, <coughs> and, and I mentioned, you know, now that that's a thing that's possible, they went to go plunder more. Yeah. So that entire ship of Dragonborn is fucked. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And then, okay, and then after all of that stuff with the the Myconids, you then went back to Broken Star Bay, back to, talk to, Bay. Talk to Shark, and of course the whole deception yeah. thing. And then yes, after that, yeah. we went and we went back home to Koiko. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which in between uh, there, yeah. just to say, between there we met, we stopped by an island for a surfing, <laughs> a little beach episode quotation mark for a little bit of surfing, but found out, and that's how we met Whisper. Who and was that's in. also when we had our first encounter with Omaiko's eye. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go in that pocket dimension, basically it had. Yeah. Um, me, Hanu, and kill him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was only them three who went in to get Whisper out because everybody else couldn't really swim well at yeah. that point. So Whisper, um, Cielf Akujioni, we just knew she was a Cielf because her mother was one of the few Cielfs, or at least to our knowledge, the only Cielf. Uh, and, you know, we had an agreement. We went in there. As we came out, this is when the Avatar of the Devil... Uh, killed Whisper's mother in front of her oh, and Hanu. We missed a whole fucking thing. After. So when oh, yeah, when we okay. went to Broken Star Bay, we found uh, we for, I forgot. Oh, what, yeah, oh we found yeah. we met yeah. Hoenn. Okay, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll we, summarize we this one short. real quick. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so <laughs> when you got back to Broken Star Bay, uh, they uh, met back up with. Uh, the shark, and there was that whole finishing up of the deal there. And then they talked to the um, Puali Wicca. Um, now, the Puali Wicca uh, is like the Puali Mana of Puali Manas, right? He's the Pope, right? He's the one that pretty much keeps the peace accord in the Coterie Coast that, like, all the pirates respect, right? And... Uh, he's a very chill dude, and he knows the group, but he knew a version of them that was from the future, right? In his past, he met a version of them from the future, is what he said, right? Um, so you knew and, all of them. Yeah, and, and that 
in that regard, uh, he ended up uh, giving the group, you know, permission to go into the uh, orphanage. Now, the orphanage there um, is the origin that, up to that point, as far back as any of the orphans could trace themselves. And it was specifically just uh, Rue so and Zale. Uh, or Rue slash Lib and Zale. And it's also um, where we met Owen because he also was from there. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Hoenn and that was, was objective when we first met. Yeah, Hoenn was trying to get back in to see the, you know, the orphanage that he had grown up in. And they met him at the gate to it. And the group, you know, kind of collaborated and then all chose to, like, gain some more information. Got a bunch of holy water and then ended up going into the orphanage now the orphanage had a whole bunch of haunted rumors about it so they were going in prepared for spooky haunted stuff all right uh zale uh ended up uh having a very close encounter with a ghost of somebody named uh sister teresa now uh, sister teresa um ended up actually being the ghost of a well somebody that's kind of still alive see sister Teresa died long ago however she's continued on as mother Teresa now or now sorry not Teresa it's Giselle, Giselle yeah. remember oh, yeah. yes uh, uh, so mother Giselle is um the uh night hag as they were able to find out a night hag that was working for the spider but she seemed to be working with the spider on the goal of bringing the avatar of the devil to life now while investigating this haunted orphanage they found a secret antechamber hidden underneath the basement. And as they went in, there was this whole experiment going on with these strange crystals that shades were being drawn into. And as the shades filled them with like these shadows of these souls, it ended up completing a ritual uh, that ended up allowing the avatar of the devil to manifest. Now, yeah, so the Avatar of the Devil had the checks to even get because uh, also in one yeah, of those crystals that Zarmer was fighting the entire fight was to get the head point of the Sun Spear, but Zarmer could not yes. pull it out. As uh, one of the missions that uh, Zarmen had gotten from the voice of Saint Eva um, was to retrieve the parts for the Sun Spear. Um, the idea being that. We're, Storing the Sun Spear would help restore Ava's divinity. Um, but it's separated into two parts, and the uh, head of this spear was currently jabbed into this chest of this uh, crystallized avatar of the devil. And as this fight went on, and he failed multiple checks trying to yank it out of him. Yeah, because, uh, like you know, Chase being Chase trained to strengthen made it where he could pull it out any further. And it was acting like a um, uh, like a soul lightning rod in a way. So uh, as the uh, shadow crystals were shattered and he was born into this world, he greeted the party, recognizing them from other timelines and being amused about whether or not they would be useful in this one. And then burning up the whole room in a show of fire and flame that sets the and whole place And he also took the head of the Sun Spear with him. And he takes the head of the Sun Spear with him and is gone with the Night Hag. And the group, you know, escape out of the, you know, burning hallways of this uh, secret antechamber beneath the church. Uh, all of the ghosts and stuff go away from it. The place is no longer haunted anymore. Uh, and they set back out uh, and then end up departing to go back home. Um, as they uh, go to head back home, they make a stop for a beach episode to do some surfing because there's a, an island that sells, you know, good surfing. Yeah, because Hanu talked with some local water genasi and learned that there's a board dealer down this way. 
And on that same tiny little surfing island, the reason it's attractive is because it's nearby. It's not too far away from Maiko's Wrath, so we get some of those waves. But most notably, there is a rock outcropping there. There's a very narrow gap between it that the waves you can sometimes ride right through that narrow thing. And they call it going into the, the eye of Maiko. Um, what they didn't realize is that it actually takes you into a demiplane when you do that. Um, and so if you succeed and don't get crashed against the rocks, you get pulled into an underwater demiplane where Maiko's eye watches all. And down there, she had several... Um, in a, she had informed Killam that there were several rogue... Um, what she called dogs that needed to be reminded that they were, you know, dogs. Um, and <laughs> so she just wanted to kill him to go there and snap the leash real quick, you know. Uh, and and while they were doing it, they could rescue this daughter of this local Pualimana, mm -hmm. who is a sea elf. Uh, that daughter ended up being Whisper, who herself was not a sea elf. She was actually an Akujioni. Akujioni are like tieflings, but they're tieflings of Maiko. All right, they are born of aberrations. All right, or of you know abolists and things like them. So not yeah. necessarily Maiko, but things like Maiko. Yeah. There's often been a theorized connection between aboliths and Maiko. They seem to predate predate Maiko, yeah. but they share a lot of things in common that, you know, yeah. people theorize our, that our... Maiko herself might be an Akujioni uh, mm -hmm. born. So, of... are, are the Akujioni something that people just know about, or is that like... It's probably more in the Kotori Coast, because they've been an issue yeah. for since the bereavement. Uh... Okay. Yeah, they're not like a secret, but it is more of a local thing down yeah. there. Uh, because they've been like a like giants for Avail is yeah. kind of like Avail's there. Yeah, they've yeah. been seen as seals who've had um like through who've been involved with blood, you know, weird cults that interacted with the Kujis. So it's seen as like a stain on your family lineage if you have that up here. Because sometimes it'll skip many generations. But with yeah, the uh, yeah the origins of a Kujioni is right after the bereavement and the chaos a lot of people that lived on these islands and like little villages and you know stuff like that some people in the facilities themselves when they came out from their fallout shelters after all the dust came out pretty much they um they were all disoriented you know none of their islands were close to each other the waters were more treacherous than at any other period of time um and so what they the ability to navigate and even get to other islands was completely gone the sky was blackened without any stars for years right and during that period of time those dark years immediately after the bereavement um a lot of these people heard whispers and calls coming out from the ocean, you know, and some of them answered those calls and listened to them and made sacrifices to them. And those were like the first like cults born out from the Yakuji, mm -hmm. um, aboliths. Um, the aboliths, um, uh, did end up having these rituals where they actually mated with some of these sacrifices and the spawn of those mates would end up which like don't try to wrap your mind around what that entails um no. and they the young that would be born of that would then have to like swim to the surface right or like die um and get eaten and most of them would die before they make it up to the top. But if one did make it out onto the shore, the villagers viewed them as like a fucking god sent prophet for a while, right? And those people ended up leading a lot of these cults. And those were the first Akujioni, the mm -hmm. ones that survived making it out 
from being born underneath the ocean from a foul ritualistic yeah. birthing and then they created cults and then over time though the world opened back up again the cults got you know squashed fell into like you know disfavor hid themselves out of shame and then it became a recessive trait that every once in a while in a family will pop up in somebody and then just like the family curse just hit them and yeah. like their parents or family members could have been all looking like their race for generations and then suddenly boom, yeah. one of them is born looking like that and they go oh shit you suddenly realize that like one of your ancestors did some really fucked up shit mm -hmm. right um, and that's the most of the cases. There hasn't been a first generation of Kujioni in a very, very long time. Yeah. Um, Whisper is a first generation of Kujioni. Um, it seems there's something odd about her birth uh, and the fact that she has like a mother and a father, but something about the nature of her uh, uh, being conceived. Uh, all of that uh, seemed to have culminated in, in a deal that her mother had made uh, with uh, this abolith that worked with Maiko, right? Now, Maiko had several abolists that like, she kind of controls, right? But the abolists don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. So they often chafe against it and often try to do their own things and create their own thralls and yeah. Every once in a while she has to... yeah. So the one thing with Akuji is that um, through the knowledge she's gained before with her ancestor who was Takaro's first champion of the Triton, and as we were talking about how Takaro slash the Warden is the antivirus, he made the Triton be the immune system of like the shit that's going down in the ocean. Where, uh, but um, is that Something with whales is how a lot of Akuji can actually get spawned. They go to Maiko's Wrath, and then most of them come out as Akuji, but the Akujis tend to call their own populations. They usually end up killing each other, but like that's the one thing that there's like a connection between the Akuji and Maiko. Is just, she's able to create them somehow, somehow, like for some reason. But the Akuji were there before. She's just able to at least help their numbers grow yeah, okay because most of the time they'll they'll end up fighting each other to the death or the mother will end up eating most of the children so they yeah something about maiko's wrath will attract whales and herds and those whales will uh die after being driven kind of insane so you'll get these really insane whales nearby around Mayako's Wrath that will, like, attack ships and, like, wreck them and shit. So, yeah. Like, eventually we'll get one of those fucking sea encounters where I fuck you up with a giant whale. Yeah. Um, we got a small taste but... of it with uh, with the Kujioni that looked just like a whale, so that's why she asked yeah, the question of, what the fuck was reason. that? Yes. Yeah, you have to fight a baby Akuji. Yeah. Uh, but as we went and we saved Whisper, we went back and we're like, okay, you can go meet your ma. Oh shit, she's getting strangled and yeah, by the uh, devil, Savitar. That's the joke Oopsies. I kept making of grandma got choke slammed by the devil Captain came from. Uh. <laughs> so we found out that uh, and her hair knew some shit because she just basically gave him the two middle fingers and said, fuck you. Uh, so yeah, that's how Whisper got, uh, she was on her own vengeance quest, trying to figure out more about the devil, and then kind of ruminating as we went to Koiko, and then on yeah. Koiko. And of course, that was the tone that we went to Koiko with, yeah. which, uh, oh boy. at the end of that talk, or, like, settling with Whisper, was when Lib came back from swapping from Ryu, saying that Arthur was at home. Yeah, and we needed to go to Arthur, because he's trapped but yeah. it's a, it's like they it's needed a to, week. that they needed to dig him out of a grave. Yeah, and it's like a week, a week journey there. So we're like, shit, we have a time limit. <laughs> Turns out he doesn't need to breathe yeah. or eat. So 
it's like, oh, okay. But they dig him up out of a grave. They find a crumbling statue. Um, and as they uh, dig up the soil from beneath it, there's him just, you know, asleep in it. And he meets the group for the first time. And that's the first time they meet Arthur. As you know, Arthur is them digging him out of a grave on their home island that they traveled back to after having traveling 15 years in the future, just after having released the devil who ended up, like, you know, killing somebody just before they got there. Yeah, and, okay. And that's the tone at which they met Arthur. And then Arthur informed them pretty promptly that, it's like, he doesn't have any fucking answers for the group, right? Uh... And offered, you know, uh, some insight into his disposition about all things related to fate and the gods, uh, which is kindly, I try not to think about it. Um, <laughs> and, and that's uh, also where, because shortly after that is when Zorin got to meet Deacon again. Mm -hmm. and... and Deacon was from the same ship that uh, Zarman had been on, that had been laid siege to by... Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Captain Bones when he had been uh younger. Yep. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, I'm scratching things. Uh, mixing things yeah, up. Yeah, it, 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 it was Different on ship. another ship after Zerman was born. So yes, Deacon is currently uh the running shop a, owner running a of the lighthouse, like basically yeah. in our old tavern that older arthur used to run so we're like we gotta yes. go to the to the to the lighthouse oh shit it's a tourist shop deacon yo <laughs> where you at man yeah after their whole event of going down into those ruins um the ruins blew up actually and the uh, the remains of the ruin are actually still stuck floating in the air above where those ruins are next to the island they grew up on and Deacon has made a business out of delving into those ruins and pulling out useless junk that nobody else will use and selling it as memorabilia, right? And tourist stuff, and then using the stuff that he will find useful for his own inventions because he's a, a tinker. And um, they ended up... Uh... Yeah, and then with a uh, request from Deacon was to help him get his uh, shit back because apparently during some recent expedition he lost his staff that allows him to control his ship because yeah, <laughs> uh, apparently for him to keep a monopoly on getting the stuff from the ruins he set up turrets as a deterrent for everybody else from going in it yep and his control rod pretty much for those turrets he had lost in the ruins and then they went in and they fought rat apocalypse which was a giant swarm of rats uh shaped like the devil um and as in they fuck that thing, I'm just saying yes and that is when hoen uh freaking shot through them all with a flurry of fucking bullet sprays and um then the turrets got turned around on them and then the fucking things got cleaned up and they delved and they saw that down now the rat apocalypse had been popping out of the same hole that saint ava's crystal had been found on when they first went into those ruins and that um and uh, continued yeah it continued down and down and down and down and down actually into an entirely other dimension the group jumps down into it with some feather fall stuff right well ho and climb down uh, and i mean there was some shenanigans down. involved but we all yeah, there was some shenanigans. Some bottoms. and they all safely make their way to the bottom of a pocket dimension uh that is known as the lost laboratory of Quayla. Now, this is the location of the shadow of Quayla, which is a construct, it's a statue resembling a mind flare named Quayla. The statue has several uh, uh, Aeon crystals like in its uh, head that help actually store all of the memories of the original Quayla. 
Koila had created it to like help you know him keep track of things and also identify intruders and shit like that and you know keep things running. Um, but Koila long ago, the actual Koila went mad, and so there is a maddened, ravenous version of a mind flare starved uh, somewhere within this pocket dimension. The group didn't explore very far. They instead questioned the shadow of Quayla and got, you know, some keen insights into Such the fate as, uh, of another. Lib in particular. Yeah, they found out some things relating to Lib, and they also found out some things relating to the fact that uh, there is a trial, or in a way, a gate that keeps people from becoming too powerful in the mortal world. And the only way of getting past that is what they call sainthood. Um, and the only way that you can achieve that, um, well, you know, one of the only ways, it turns out that's not exactly true, um, but there's a very limited number of ways, the main one being going through what they call the crucible. Uh, the crucible uh, is created as a kind of demi-plane slash trial to help screen through people that try to become saints. Um, it used to exist by being anchored within the mind of Saint Ava, but during her time within stasis after the bereavement, it was evidently removed from her mind. The process of it being removed, that demiplane of that trial of saints was instead placed inside of Lib slash Rune. In fact, the fact is, Lib and Rue don't have all the parts of their soul. They're actually two separate people who, like I said, the soul has three parts, the shadow, the anima, and the spark. The uh, Lib and Rue are only spark, no shadow. Um, they are two separate people's sparks that were fused together in order to keep this uh, crucible anchored somewhere and so currently the gateway to sainthood is inside of lib and rue's mind and uh the uh i guess like the the crux on that is that with talking to koila uh that is also uh, where this version of CAC comes into the story, because... Uh, During the downtime that... of Koiko, uh, he ended up going back to the ruins himself. And then uh, yes. that's when the transition there happened. There was an alternate version of CAC that had been trapped within that place with Koila, um, and... The other cat interacted with him, and when he came back out, the other cat came back out. Or rather, a fusing of the two, because they seem to share bits and pieces of each other's memories. Um, so, uh, they don't have the other cat, but this other alternate version of him came out. Um, and Koila also gave them their first insight into another dimension that had met an ill in. In his dimension, in his timeline, Illithids rule. They conquered the entire universe, they even conquered the gods. However, something else destroyed their universe. Some sort of corruption aided away until the only thing that was left is his facility floating in a demi plane in a pocket dimension outside of time and space. So he's just floating huh. like a little huh. lifeboat of a dead universe. And that was their first gaining of information about the fact that there is the uh, some sort of threat to the gods and to the multiverse itself. Uh, that the gods themselves can be defeated, but even those that defeat the gods are unprepared for whatever this is. And that's the only hint they've had on that. And then, um, before getting to parse through any of that stuff or the new arrival of Kak for too long, uh, yeah, Zael and, and Libby had an excursion. Hanu uh, confessed to Zarmin about 
Victor actually being the fool. Yes. Because uh, it was with the talk with our sage. Because uh, sage was like the village elder of Goeko. And it was with the oh. talk with that dwarf that Hanu was able to figure out that Victor was the fool. Mm-hmm. After the and, you know, talk- he, we were getting lectured of, well, we didn't listen to him about not going into the ruins because that was literally his entire shtick. Don't go yeah. into those fucking ruins. <laughs> so what had happened after we finished talking to Quayla and we got transferred back up, we met with Sage and he said, what the heck did you guys do? And he bamfed out of a little, like, kind of portal or something. He had a job to do, but he's like, eh, good job. The Sage will this. come back up at one point. Yep. I'm excited for when you guys come across him again one day. So, yeah. Uh, but, yep. Uh, after that, we, we, had dis- she, we had discussed that something's up with Victor. Hmm. Anyways... <laughs> Sail, what um, are you doing? And he jumps yeah, in. Yeah, and then and and during that downtime, that they actually discovered some shit. So I'll let Jens go into that now. The, the tea, there was somebody else staying in the inn at the Tipsy Lighthouse. Well, the only person staying there, and they'd been staying there for quite some time. Um, a wizard who had a singular samurai bodyguard. Right, this wizard is the tea master. Uh, the tea master. Um, is an actor who hasn't been given a whole lot of, you know, uh, screen time, I guess you could say, but they, but the they're another one of, of those. They were there has been extreme help and also funny as fuck. Yes. They, uh, as the group, uh, kind of burst into his apartment because of, uh, an order of chaotic events that I honestly cannot even attempt to summarize right now. Uh, um, it, but I they, mean, but it was an important decision of uh, how Zale decided to gather information. Let, uh, to oh yes. another in another. Yeah, they, <laughs> they wanted they wanted to they wanted to stalk and gain information on this, and then it ended up turning into at one point trying to steal his lunch, and then at the next point <laughs> it turned into a reveal because the tea master is somebody Arthur is familiar with. In that also, demi plane in Libby's, in that demi plane in Libby's mind, where Lib found Arthur and gained the information that they needed to dig him out of uh, uh, this grave in order to bring them in, him into y'all's world. Um, while she had met him there, he hadn't been alone. He'd actually been kept company inside of the demi plane by the tea master. Arthur spent, like, an untold period of time in a timeless demiplane trying to endlessly get the drop on a guy that can't be gotten the drop on. Like, Arthur attempted everything he could ever try and attempt for an endless period of time trying to attack this guy, and that guy just sits there with his eyes closed drinking his tea, right? And it never lands. He can't get a hit on this guy. Um, so of course and... when Lib decided to, because in response to Lib seeing the team master, she obviously yeah, used obviously. message to Arthur saying he's here, <laughs> and that proceeded and... to more chaos. And so Arthur decides that he's gonna get his moment now, right? And he bursts in through the front door, right? And Lib crashes in through the window that they've been spying through yeah spying and... through but with not anything they've been using the fucking what was that one board that we lost the uh, nimbus, uh, the nimbus. A nimbus baby. Is, imagine like a mechanical flying carpet that turns you invisible oh, which yeah. is how they were watching out the window but once arthur and... broke into the room they flew into the room and chaos proceeded even further yes <laughs> that he had a teleportation circle primed and hidden underneath the carpet and as they all like collide into the middle of the room at the same time he teleports them all to Port Valiant alright and (laughs) uh and the rest of the group arrive right and he informs them that he'd been planning on sending the whole group together right but they had gotten like a week later but then the shit happened exactly all right, but and then uh, the rest of the group proceeded to on. gather together to go to Port Valiant now with the teleport, and of course, uh, bringing along people who wanted to come along, type of thing. 
And so they leave the ship behind in Koiko to try and sail up and meet them in Port Valiant. And they instead go to meet up with Zael uh, and Arthur and uh, Lib, who have teleported all the way up to Port Valiant, thousands of miles away. And the rest of the group follow tail, and they end up finding themselves inside of the embassy um, of I, the Jalon embassy in Port Valiant. Now, this is just a bunch of elves with a bunch of bows at the ready, and they have some awkward conversations, but they manage to, you know, but get out. But thankfully, since they always the first one to show up, basically, they did not fire. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and they ended up uh, uh, making some connections with him, went out into the city, uh, and in Port Valiant, this is where one of the first people that they end up interacting with, Cizel decides to try and investigate the black market um, by asking people <laughs> about the that black game. market. Yeah. And, yeah. and he and he and Cac end up getting arrested for trying to solicit illegal <laughs> goods. Um, and so they, they end up spending a night, they spend a night in jail. Um, and the rest of the group end up uh, finding their lodgings for the evening. And along the way there, they come across this cathedral. There's a big old church there back from the time of, you know, the saints, right? It's not used as a church anymore because people don't really worship saints because they're all dead. But it's still there historically, and there are still priests, but they're mostly like historians at this point. Um, and there's a big maze garden out in front of it. And this, uh, this hedge maze... Uh, is tended to by this gnome uh, gardener. And as they meet this gnome gardener, they ended up actually uh, discovering that he's a pretty powerful druid, kind of feigning as a, um, as a gardener, overseeing this hedge maze. But he seems to have found himself in a predicament because uh, he's misplaced some things, including a magical acorn, which he says is the key to his house. Um, and the uh, dryad that was the guardian for this house. The dryad is probably out looking for the acorn, and until it finds it, it was going to kind of like go all crazy and nutso and stuff, right? And so it had been like causing problems and shit in the city, and they were like, we'll, we'll look into this stuff. And he's like, well, while you do that, deliver this tea to my friends at the Shaolan Embassy, since you know them. And they're like, oh yeah, we can do that. And on their way to go to the Shaolan Embassy, they end up coming across more clues onto why his stuff went missing. Which is that there had been several other break-ins and things going missing in the city. Um, a series of break-ins. And that's where they met Eliza investigating these series of break-ins in the Market District. Um, having figured out that one of them in particular was the one that had been broken in ahead of the others, and then it had been probably broken into by somebody different than the other ones, right? Uh, they found it to be a magic shop that sold wands, out of which one Pridwin Co. ended up exiting while they were investigating. Mm. Uh, this is the first time that they actually interact with Pridwin Co. like in person. It's very brief. And he literally just like, like sees this ragtag group of adventurers, disregards them entirely, and walks on by. Um, and the um, uh, the group figured out that he'd been there getting a, like a, a wand custom made, right? Uh, probably in preparation for a trip to Omido. Um, and that he had an airship there that was actually built using former Stars and Sea Society property. You see, in the paperwork that they had found on their ship, the Star Runner, they had found paperwork that, you know, put them as being members of the Stars and Sea Society, had their names and shit in it and all this stuff, very magically officialized, and, uh, and then the deed for another ship, all right? Now, that other ship was a much bigger ship, and that was the Wave Sweeper. It was, um, however, 
kept in a storage facility by Tirana while she had been pretty much trying to figure out where the fuck the group went for 15 years. And then it eventually uh, ended up getting bargained on the black market. The warehouse got sold, and then the warehouse was the ship. And Prudwin ended up getting a hold of the ship, and he used its in-bar engine to help power a uh, an airship. So he turned what had been a very fancy, magical uh, seafaring vessel into an airship, using some, you know, a lot of money. All right. Uh, he didn't personally design it himself. He just paid and endorsed for the entire thing. And his endorsement, it was actually a multi like group operation. The queen had a hand in it. So pretty much everybody that ends up being on that maiden voyage had something to do with the money that went into making that into an airship. Um, but Pridwin kind of chiefed that thing and his name ended up on the side of the ship as a result. Right. Um, so Tarana uh, and Arthur, who at that point don't know that they're related, both see the name on that ship and they both remark upon it, but they don't see, they don't hear each other remark. Right. And so right. Either, either point of them either, making the remark, the other one is not there. Yes. And so the group ends up going, oh, crap. Do you think they're related? Oh, how are we going to break this to them? That doesn't end up getting put together until they're there at Rose Marie's that time. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm pretty I sure Bobette that. was there for you when we there finally that. broke that with Arthur. Yes. Um, and so they put together this whole plan of trying to figure out how they're going to get their airship back. They're like, we have a legitimate claim to it. It's ours, right? It was allowed to be sold in the first place. Um, but knowing that there's a lot of political clout and people tied into it, uh, they're left with, you know, having to figure out a way of either, you know, gaining dirt that will help them in court or gaining favor. Thankfully, they end up gaining a lot of favor very quickly as their investigation ends up bringing them below Port Valiant, where the whole interaction with Eliza's family castle ends up happening. There's this swarm of a curse that gets activated and these threats from several different threats all culminate at once in the city and that's the that's the thing as well like you'll see it's the one of the first times that that happens but it will happen repeatedly throughout this campaign of coming into a scenario and realizing that there are multiple threats involved that have nothing to do with each other they just all happen to be happening at the same time unfortunately yeah because one of them was the sorrow sworn which you know was the big major thing fucking the ship but there's also other players such as the werewolves who were part of the beast mm -hmm. exactly and the break-ins that had precipitated all of that stuff to beginning so the yeah. so the, something the, else the werewolves, there. uh it, that whole kickoff of events um the clues that they put together on that seem to lead to this woman with a white feathered cloak being the prime suspect, right? But around that same time, on also popped up these leads with this person, the Black Lily, uh, as several things that the group had been interested in investigating all ended up having their important key details literally stolen with a trading card, or like a trademark Black Lily left behind, right? And they're like, that can't be a coincidence. Though one of the things had been stolen nearly a hundred years before the group had even arrived there, and the others were stolen rather recently, the only thing that they all seem to have in common is that the group were all interested in them, all right? So they're like, is the Black Lily the thing that's kicking off the, the chaos? Because... These were, the way the order events from the other timeline showed, those three different events were all supposed to happen at different times. But their arrival in the city ended up somehow making it to where all of those separate threats all happened at pretty much the same time. Um, the group got to end the threat all at once instead and got left with just the one last one, which was the necromancer that was trying to turn themselves into a lich. Uh, they finished that, like, the cherry on top, uh, really just right, left after with hearing about the vision from Killam, because after resolving shit down, 
below Port Valiant is when we had the after party with the Maravessis, and it was at that after party where we hear that, uh, and also Zell's fucking becoming a blood hunter mm-hmm. is where Killam gave the vision yeah. that Mayako gave him to Which the rest is of us. Why the first suspicion of Valerie came up because she seemed highly interested and was just unsettling before. Just the way that yeah, she was Val- acting was kind of a little Valerie different. was this again random socialite cousin, right? Who was just there for the family get together and reunion. But when they all wandered off to listen to Killam, you know, tell his story about this dream, um, she's the only Marabessi that went over there and listened in. But she was just like, this seems like the most only interesting thing going on here right now. So, you know, like, so she just seemed to be a casual listener. And then herself, she then took that information and went straight to Adamar with it, um, which caused them to call in Matthias, their uncle, the gauntlet. Um, because in the other timeline, the uh, Killam's dream had revealed that he had been a death knight for Orcus. And as they um, called him in, his memory had been modified. He's telling the truth. He doesn't seem to know about betraying anybody. Um, and he turns himself in and is now, to this point, still in prison in Port Valiant. Um, and another thing that we learned from that vision is that two NPCs that we haven't been seeing in a while, because we did have like a week of downtime beforehand, is that Tirana and Willow were locked down there. They got well, at least Tirana was. Yeah. Willow mm-hmm. escaped. He was locked yeah. down there. He escaped. Yeah, so and Tirana the other... Yeah. Yeah, and Tirana her memory was modified escaped, too. Yeah. Yes, and her memory was modified to not even remember being imprisoned. Yeah. The only Willem, however, is like... Yeah. No, we were both definitely imprisoned. I had to make a very daring, dashing escape that did not involve me crawling through sewage at all. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, I believe him. And, uh, and yeah, so that week culminated with them ending three different threats that had all been somehow manipulated to happen all at once. And it... If they had happened separately, they might have just been taken as being separate problems, right? Because they don't seem to have anything related to each other, other than they all have different actors and different motivators, right? Yeah. They just were all forced to happen at the same time. And the only thing that seems like it could have prompted that is the group's arrival. They're, they suss out that whoever this person in this white feathered cloak is, is somebody that recognized their arrival and then made things happen faster because of it and as a result yeah, they kind of revealed themselves as an actor happened no, probably not yeah. as well as they were in there and now they no, have shown no. up three times yes mm-hmm. exactly they showed up again in hearthvine when you were going through with your chase scene with eliza uh dealing with cabaret members specifically tieflings um and then again, you saw a woman that uh, could be her. I mean, seems to have like similar, you know, you haven't ever seen her face, so you still don't know what she actually looks like. Uh, but you can tell that it's a woman with a white, you know, feather. She really likes that feathered motif. Yes, it's her symbolism. Yeah. And she's taking that in reference to uh, an ancient figure of sorcery. Yes. So it's like, yes, okay, they're... well. They like there magic. are the three matrons, and um, the three matrons are the origins of like the three hags, the three fates. They, they are the, the originators of magic in this world. One of, uh, one of those three, uh, uh, uh the matrons, is specifically uh, known for having taught magic to mortals, and. That before her, like, no, we didn't know magic. All right. So, and that is specifically the one with the white feathered cloak. So she's taking on the motif of the person that taught magic to mortal. Is she that a common story like, that, that we know? It is a common story. It is. It's, it's, it's strong cultural, it's strong worldwide folklore at that point. It has different names. Some people call them the three hags and, and view them more like bad nefarious actors 
kidnapping children and shit like that. But others view them as, you know, being like wise women and shit like that. They're sometimes called the mothers, and all the three mothers, the, the, the favor- uh, favorable look, because, you know, generally all bills yes. pro magic. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, mm-hmm. and then that's kind of everything just got jump started again as we went to all bills. So, and take it away. Okay. So now. Babette kind of has a proper idea of Babette and Rachel now have like a proper idea of your adventures so far. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think there's always a bunch of little details that involve yeah, the characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, like it's one of those things where it's tr- you know it's been explained before, but I wasn't really invested like in the world as much, so I didn't. It kind of didn't. Oh no! Yeah, you have to have the context stuff build yeah. up story before all that stuff even has room to be categorized yeah. in your brain. Yeah, but also you just opened a book that had a lot of paragraphs and mm-hmm. very small font, and you're like, "Well, I'll I'll figure this out later." <laughs> you could, in a way, akin the white feathered matron to being, um, uh. Like if somebody were if somebody were to choose to take that motif on, it would be like somebody in our world having a lot of Prometheus symbology around them, yeah. right? Which is why both me and Hanu are very concerned about the vagrants because okay, we have somebody who's parading themselves as you know a magic user, and there's a uh, seems to be something that was going on uh, with this one village in Yellow, which caused a lot of. Uh, shit to go down which is why she's extremely concerned about the possible ties of who this lady is and to the Maravessi family because there were footprints going from there's there's more yeah there's more clues of why her interest got peaked in looking at Valerie so it's very convenient mm-hmm. that uh that well and now this woman in the white feathered cloak is something that Babette's concerned about because she's all up in her business, in the spy business. And also tieflings, which you know, Babette is adjacent to. Yeah, so And now is connected to Eliza in some weird time way. hmm Yeah. Oh god, that video stuff of y'all's internet research. I'm so fucking happy that you guys fucking researched that stuff i was like yes <laughs> they can start putting some of this stuff together so I was like, yeah because it's a fucking lot man like this is not the type of story that you can like summarize to somebody very well all right it's mm-hmm. there's a lot going on this is why this is a several years long campaign i'm never gonna do one like this ever again okay <laughs> like, the level of planning that has gone into theorizing how this will all plan out is fucking daunting it's fun i love it so much but like oh shit okay Um, all the fucking threads are there any other questions you have on the top of your head rachel because i'm Um, about to pause the recording or stop it yeah yeah nothing i can think of right now gotcha gotcha roger that I'll put this on Dropbox and you can yeah. look it up. I think that I'm just kind of going to start making sure that I ask, is this paradox knowledge or common knowledge a little bit more? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. All right. 